Hello and Namaste. Welcome to Temples, Books and Science. Today I want to talk to you about this brilliant book called Phantoms in the Brain. So many philosophies of the world proclaim that this world is just an illusion. When I read this book, I realized how literary too this is. Dr. V. S. Ramachandran is a world-renowned neuroscientist. He has done groundbreaking work on a neurological condition called phantom limbs. This is a condition frequently observed in amputees. Many people whose leg or arm is amputated feel as if the missing limb is still there. The term phantom limb was coined during the American Civil War when many soldiers were badly wounded and their limbs had to be amputated. Many of them continued to feel the missing limb. Some patients don't even believe the doctor when he tells them that their limb has been amputated because they can vividly feel its presence. They feel a strong urge to itch this limb or worse still, feel excruciating pain in the missing limb. Phantom is another word for ghost. The limb is dead and gone, but still lingers on in the mind like a ghost. There were many theories put forward to explain this phenomenon. The most common explanation was that it was a psychological problem. The patients were so traumatized by the loss of their limb that their mind went into denial, similar to people seeing ghosts of loved ones after they die. It was Dr. V. S. Ramachandran who discovered that this was a neurological problem caused by the brain wrongly rewiring itself. The way he determined the cause of this problem and the ingenious method he devised to treat it is pure genius. You have to read the book to know how. He describes another condition called blind sight. The patients claim that they are blind, they cannot see anything. However, they function like they can see. They can reach out and pick up objects like a sighted person. They can even perform complex tasks like posting a letter in a mailbox without being able to see. It turns out that they can in fact see, but it does not register in their consciousness. They do not have the awareness of sight. It is as though a zombie is in their mind carrying out all these tasks without involving them at all. Then there is a condition called false pregnancy. Some women who desperately want to get pregnant develop all signs and symptoms of real pregnancy. Their stomach becomes huge. They develop the characteristic gait of pregnant women. They stop menstruating. They lactate. They have morning sickness and can feel the fetal movements. It all culminates in actual labor pain. Everything seems normal except that there is no baby. If human brain can conjure up something as complex as pregnancy, then what else can the brain do for the body? Like all the best science books that I have read, this one too raises some fundamental existential questions. What is self? What is free will? What is consciousness? What is reality? The book is so brilliant and so full of mind-blowing insights, I really struggle to decide which ones to share with you today. In keeping with the theme of this series, Science for the Soul, I will talk about what the brain tells us about God and why the belief in God is so prevalent. There is a part in our brain called limbic system. Patients who suffer seizures in this part of the brain often have deeply moving spiritual experiences, including a feeling of divine presence and a sense that they are in direct communication with God. Everything around them is imbued with cosmic presence. They claim that a divine light illuminates all things. They perceive deep beauty and grandeur in ordinary things. We have all heard the story of Joan of Arc who claimed that God spoke to her. It is quite possible she was suffering from seizures in this part of the brain. Why does it happen? Does God really visit these people? One hypothesis which Dr. VSR puts forward is this. It is possible that human beings have evolved specialized neural circuitry dedicated for religious experiences. 
human belief in supernatural is so widespread in all societies all over the world that it is likely to have a biological basis. We may be tempted to conclude from this that God is just in our mind. Some quirk of evolution makes us all believe in a non-existent supernatural being. But there is another way of looking at this. For example, certain animals cannot see color, whereas we can. That does not mean that color is not real. We can apply the same argument to God. Maybe human brain is the only organ that has evolved the capacity to contact the Almighty. Isn't this what most religions claim to? You know what I thought as I was reading this chapter? If there is in fact a specialized circuitry in our brain for religious experience, then it just shows how important it is to our well-being. If the neutral forces of evolution chose to incorporate these circuits in the most important organ of our body, then it can only mean that it is very, very, very important for our survival. Call me biased if you wish, but that was my inference after I read this chapter. There was another great scientist who thought there was something special about the brain that cannot be explained by natural selection. His name was Alfred Russell Wallace. He was a contemporary of Charles Darwin and an equally brilliant biologist. In fact, the first scientific paper on evolution was presented jointly by Darwin and Wallace. However, these two brilliant scientists disagreed on one aspect of evolution. Darwin believed that every aspect of human beings, including our brain, is the product of natural selection. Wallace, however, disagreed. He said certain unique abilities of our human brain, like our capacity for mathematics and music, cannot be explained by natural selection. Our brain has a potential intelligence which is vastly greater than what was required for the survival of our species. If you go back in time and bring back a prehistoric child to the present and provide him with modern education, he'll be no different from any other child of our generation. Why did the capacity for complex computation like calculus, language, poetry and music evolve in our brain thousands of years before we ever needed them? What survival advantage did it provide our prehistoric ancestors? Wallace argued that human beings have been given this amazing instrument called the brain much in advance of when we actually needed it. But evolution does not have foresight. It cannot anticipate that you will need an ability in future and give it to you in advance. In case of human beings, it seems to have made an exception. Therefore, Wallace concluded that it must have been done by God. Some higher intelligence must have directed the process by which the human nature was developed. This is where Wallace parted ways with Darwin, who resolutely maintained that every human trait that we have can be explained by natural selection. VSR concludes with a fascinating discussion on consciousness. He talks about two versions of reality. There is an objective scientific reality of the world comprising of laws of nature. There is also a subjective reality which is unique and cannot be fully described by science. Let me explain with an example. When a certain wavelength of light reaches my eye, I see red. This is the first person account of that light. The scientific description of the same light is an electromagnetic wave of a certain frequency. Are they both same? Let us do a thought experiment to understand this. There is an alien from another world whose brain does not have the capacity to see red. He believes he can learn everything about red by studying it objectively. He identifies the wavelength of light that everyone calls red. He also studies the circuits in your brain that causes the sensation of red light. Even with this complete understanding of the nature of light and the working of our brain, he can never know the actual experience of redness. Think about it for a moment. This is the difference between subjective and objective reality. 
there is something very different about the experience of reality caused by our consciousness which can never be fully represented or understood by the objective view of reality. Recall the book Biocentrism, the first one I spoke about in the series Science for the Soul. It begins with a very similar thought on consciousness. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there, does it still make a noise? That was a physics book and this one is a book about the brain. Notice how both of them converge at the same point. What is consciousness? A question that has intrigued and stumped generations of philosophers and scientists. VSR ends this brilliant book with the beautiful words of the cosmologist Paul Davis. Through conscious beings, the universe has generated self-awareness. This can be no trivial detail, no minor byproduct of mindless, purposeless forces. We are truly meant to be here. That's it from me. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and press the bell icon for reminders. Please share it with your friends and like-minded people. Until next time, Namaste.